So here we are again at this year's Practical Classics Restoration Show at the Birmingham NEC, where I meet up with my old friends and one of my main sponsors of Classic Obsession, Footman James. I'm working round the clock over the last few days. I managed to deliver my Porsche 928 GT for one of this year's exhibits. And if you'd like to see how that little drama unfolded, then click on the link on the screen now to check out the previous episode. But it did make it in time, just. And I took pride of place Right facing the main stage amongst Danny Hopkins' minivan, which was part of an ongoing restoration throughout the show, the Bangers and Cash van, and Richard Hammond's Olivia. Gary, what's your favourite car you've ever worked? I think it's probably the current one I'm working on. Each one becomes my favourite one. Um, You know, I've just been working on the 928 GT, the Guards Red one there. Beautiful. Which I only painted three days ago. Yeah. But um, it's a more beautiful car. the, the owner was 95 years old, driving around in a 5 litre Porsche GT. Don't we all want to be doing that? But if you look inside the car, on the accelerator panel, there's a wooden block sellotaped to it because it was that big. So we can be <laughs> there. And to add to all this, the Jaguar drivers kindly allow my beloved XJS to take centre stage on their club stand amongst some rare racing E-types, which was a real honour. And what a great weekend for petrol heads and car nuts alike with an eclectic mix of vehicles of all ages, all tastes and all stages of restoration. But I'm going to start with Footman James's barn find section. Always full of surprises and rare hidden gems. Oh wow, look at this. Looks like a 52 Morris Minor. 53, no. 1952 Morris Minor. Wow, what a thing of beauty. <coughs> As you can see, I've lost my voice. Uh, too much talk and I just can't shut up. Oh, look at the interior on this. Wow. This has been sitting in a barn for many, many years. I've just been speaking to Sandy Hamilton, who's kind of well up at the Morris Minor Club. And he was explaining to me that they're going to give this to a 14-year-old girl, which I think is brilliant because it's encouraging young people to get into the classic car side of things. And she apparently has rebuilt um, an MG Midget over there with a the father. So she's uh, well used to getting her hands dirty and she's tuck, line and sinker into doing a classic up like this. But this will be great. This is like, you know, it's, it's an unassuming part of the British car industry, I suppose. It's one of the most important cars we ever had alongside the Mini. Um, and if you take a look at this here in the boot, Sandy said it was on his property. He's got eight acres and he's retired now. Look at this. I mean, there's like, you, you just don't see them in this kind of condition. It's covered in chicken poop and whatever else, but you know, this car will go again. It'll make a lovely first car for the, for the girl who's going to be working on it. And um, what a thing of beauty. I see this here, that'll just polish up that, you know. <laughs> this is uh, by far my favourite section in the whole show because it's just like cars that people have found in the garages or are rotten away in the garden under a tree. See this one, the bubble car. I remember this when, in the 1960s, when I was like four years old, we had an insurance collector who used to come to the house every week. And he used to pull up outside our house, open this. He was like a spiv with sunglasses on and a Mac. He used to stroll up to the door and get his insurance money and put it in the book, whatever. But, I mean, it's so 1960s, I mean, what a dude. Got a beautiful SS Jaguar here, which uh, I don't know what the story is behind here. My cattle's 1934 SS2 Jaguar, making its debut at the 1931 London Motor Show. The SS2 would ultimately be available in a number of body styles and production continued until 1935. And as you can see, there's plenty of work needed on this one. I wouldn't say it's a huge car, but it's got a long nose comb on it. But when you look inside the car, it's absolutely tiny. It might be a two-seater, actually. You get much in there. Another Morris Minor. This is the low light. There's actually two of them. These are slightly earlier than the one we've just looked at. These are 1950, I think. Yeah, 1950. And you know what's incredible about these? 
just like the one we looked at over there. If you look at the seats in this one as well, the seats are still the original seats and they look like they go again. They're still in fabulous condition. Now this is an interesting car. The Triumph Stag. Now everyone knows about the, the history and the demise of the Triumph Stag. These were meant to be a, a main competition for the likes of Pagoda SLs that were coming from Germany. But I mean, they couldn't really compete. I mean, look at them. Beautiful looking car, beautiful design. They were actually prettier, I think, without that roll bar thing inside. And there was a TV programme in the 70s called Hazel with a guy called Nicholas Paul in the lead part. It was written by Terry Venables, the ex-England manager. Um, and he drove around in a dark blue one of these. He was uh, like a kind of shoestring detective. But this one looks like it's going to split and fall in half. The sills are completely gone. But again, you know, nothing's impossible. This will go again. I think, uh, if I can remember rightly, they had a problem where when they were manufactured or when they were designed, they decided to make it into a V8 and weld the two engines together, basically. And they had terrible cooling problems and the engines used to go bang before they'd even hit like 40, 50,000 miles. So people just seemed to lose confidence in them. And uh, that was the, basically the, the beginning of the demise of the motor car. But uh, yeah, again, part of British car history. They had a go, I suppose. Oh, this is for sale for a thousand pounds, believe it or not. And over here, I remember my Uncle John driving around in one of these. It was a company car. He was working for my Uncle Leo, his brother. And one of his company cars, I think he had an Austin Maxi one year, uh, but he got one of these Cortinas, but it was a gear, I remember. And I think the gear meant you got like a little bit of wood in the front. There was, you know, a couple of little accessories that weren't on the basic standard vehicle. But I always remember the drail on seats and, you know, sun coming through the window. They were always comfy and warm and it was like being in the womb. But they were a very classy car as well, alongside the console and the Granadas of the time, which were all in direct competition with each other. Yeah. I think his was silver. Or was it burgundy? I can't remember. Yeah. Evocative, again, evocative of our childhood. Lanchester. This was for the more affluent people. It's almost like a Rolls Royce, isn't it? I won't even try to open that. But this is, um, this has got to be my favourite, this one here. It's a Cadillac flower. Wow. I'm not a big fan of the steering wheel. Yeah, the Cadillac flower. Now, I don't know whether this has been, this has obviously been adapted, hasn't it? Because, has it? No, well, maybe not. Is this original? I've never seen anything like this. I don't know whether it started, started out life as a um, suicide doors as well. Started out life as a, obviously a four door, kind of luxury passenger car. Only the, the filthy rich drove one of these. But I mean, I'm assuming this was uh, added or changed so that it could be like a working vehicle. But it almost looks original. I mean, it's kind of like driving Miss Daisy-esque, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely not original, all this, but this is beautiful. It almost looks original. Anyone knows about these or can tell me anything about them, I'd be interested to know. It's like a bit of a, a rocket ship van, isn't it? Look at these incredible bumpers. Look at the chrome, look at the bright work on that. Wow. Do you know what? I think it might have been a hearse. So if you look in the back here, 
it's got like the rollers where you roll a coffin or you roll something in. Could have been a hess. What's this one over here? A Vanguard. And I suppose this is all down to Footman James, who are one of the main sponsors of Classic Obsession. And as you can see, look at this. Look at the work that's gone into it. You never disappoint. That's probably why it's one of my favourite sections in the whole show. And another bit I really enjoy is meeting and chatting with members of the public. And I also get to meet some of you guys who follow the show. Anyway, I was introduced to Sue. I couldn't let her go in front of the camera, could I, looking uncool? I had to sort her hair out. And she had a really interesting story. How do you do? Nice, nice to meet you. meet you. So, what have you got? Wow. I feel like it's, it's like the Antiques Roadshow, isn't it? <laughs> it's like deja vu, this is. Yeah. I have got this car, which was a family car, and you can see us there. <laughs> It's like that one over there, the SS Jaguar. Yeah, that's a 34, whereas this is a, a 1933. Oh, wow. So it's and, uh, it, yeah, it's slightly older. Obviously, Dad passed away um, this time last year. Oh, so you. he's left me in charge of all the cars. And basically, I, I don't know what to do with it because of the fact that it's all in bits. Going through all the information, I found out that our particular car is in quite a few magazines and books. Oh, wow. Wow, and that this, is this the car. Is the exact car. That's yeah. the exact car. So, what, what, was your dad an engineer? Or something? Yeah, he, he was a car breath specialist. Oh, right. So, he was very intelligent when it came to cars. Um, Just cars, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did he have other cars? He had a 1933 standard little nine. And have you still got that? I've got that at my house right. in West Sussex, um, which needs a little bit of renovation, which I'll be doing myself. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Um, you got all the letters. Obviously, because of SS being um, a standard swallow, which incorporated the standard, and then went to Jaguar, he wanted to know exactly what car he was dealing with. Yeah. It's a standard swallow. It's yeah. definitely a standard swallow, according to this chap at the uh, Montague Museum in Beulah. Yeah. So, yeah, you've got the log book and all that wow. lot, oh, all oh, the oh, MOTs. Yeah. Um, but of course, at the moment. God, this is the car now. Yeah, it's recognisable, but it is actually in parts. It's got the chassis, the engine, it's got all the disc brakes. Well, I'm saying the disc brakes, I don't really know. Yeah. It's got the wheels, doors, then you've got the chassis there. So what do you want to do with it? I don't know. Even though it's like that, it still means a lot to me. Oh, oh, what a shame. This, this is something that happens much too often where people mm. embark on a restoration and then they sort of fall ill or they get a bit older and then other he things was, take, no take over and then suddenly you know, they pass away <laughs> and you don't know what to do with it. You don't know what's what now, do you? No, I, I have kept the other car and we were known as the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang family. <laughs> Chitty, <laughs> chitty, 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 bang, bang. In some regards, it is in better condition than the one over there, but it's just not all put yeah, together. It's pretty rough over there. It's just yeah. uh, you don't know where anything goes because it's all no. in boxes. It, it means a lot, but I just don't know what to do. I need a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, a lot of money, and as someone who's basically willing to take it on and spend probably ten years doing it because mm -hmm. it's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like a... I, I wouldn't know where to start, to be honest. I suppose the best people to ask would be the actual members of the Jaguar Drivers Club, who I'm off to see next. So how did this club come about? I mean, it's, it's quite an old club, isn't it? Oh, God, yes. They used to have um, a great big office in Pall Mall in London with oh, wow. about 10 staff yeah. in, in so 30 sporties. Well, because everybody would be so precious about their car then, because they were new, they were the in thing, they were the, they were the something that all the wealthy people would aspire yeah. to have. And so there were lots of clubs that set up in those days. I think clubs are really important yes. for, you know, as owners of these beautiful cars. Yes. You know, it's great for parts, it's great for help and, yeah. and information yeah. and support. But there's also a kind of a little bit of snobbery that goes with these clubs, or it can do. But I think it's important that all that is basically pushed out and, and we're here for everyone, yeah. isn't it? 
there should be snobbery in no club, no, that's right. not any no. club. Yeah. And it's somewhere where you make new friends, old friends, new friends. You yeah. know, that's yeah. what's so good about clubs. Yeah. It keeps See, people this, together. This is what I love about the classic car. Yes. I wouldn't say industry, but the, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it is a, a huge club in itself, isn't it? And it's nice to be part of, and I think the support is unbelievable. You know, if you, if you need help with your car, That's if you right. just want to be part yes. of something yes. and yes. talk about cars, and yes. everyone digs in and helps each other out. That's what I love about the, you know, the classic car fraternity. Um, yeah, and to me, clubs now are going to be more important than ever. I think our generation and our parents' generation have had the best ever out of beautiful cars. Where are we going with all that's coming ahead? I think we'll be okay. And that's the reason that we've got bring your car, whether it's sports car, saloon car, but yeah. the word cherished. Yeah. That's really important because young people cannot afford the classics anymore. Yeah. You know, so bring your cherished car. We will welcome you. But some people, especially the younger people, are intimidated. They think, oh, well, I've got to join a club and I don't really know much about it, but. We should welcome those people we in. And we have young and people with and minis and sprites and all sorts in our clubs. But yeah. it doesn't matter what they've got. Yeah. Come and join in. And for this, as long as you're a member of the Jaguar Drivers Club, you can bring anything. And younger people can learn from the older people. Yeah. This is all about gamesmanship in the paddock and having good fun. Yeah, good. And, and, I'm glad to hear it. Snobbery does not exist. I'm having <laughs> great fun with you two snobs anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Brian, do you know ACDC, Brian? Brian Johnson? Uh, I'm not ACDC, but whatever. We did a film with Brian. You know Brian Johnson, ACDC. Brian Johnson, how oh, often? What, what a, a lot of fun. Case, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a similar thing to what you're doing, that was making same. a film. Yeah. Yeah. It's only because my voice is gone. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> She's a 1974, so it's a back end of production series, 3E type. Just one owner had the car from new. So when I got it, he'd really driven it and enjoyed it and it was really down on its heels. So I felt it needed a complete restoration and E-Type UK were doing the Unleashed. A batch of 10 cars going through this process. Still the original engine that came with the car, but they increased the output from 5.3 to 6.1 litre. They put the fuel injection on there. I was going to say, though, yeah. this looks modern to me. The engine was originally designed by Jaguar to take fuel injection, so I think they do work so quite the, well. this is what I was going to ask, Paul. Um, you know the D-Types and the XKSS is basically the same car, isn't it? How does this engine, apart from the fuel injection, how does it vary from that engine? Well, these are the V12, the Series 3 got the V12 oh, engine, course, yeah. so yeah. you move from the 3.4s, 3.8s, yeah. 4.2s to the which V12. Were, which were really good engines, weren't they? Fantastic but engines, I'm sure yeah, this going is far superior now. I'm not sure the V12 was originally intended to go into the E-Type, but the Jaguar was struggling for a car for it to go into, and they, they put it into the E-Type. So, Bit of a shoehorn to get it in there. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a Jensen Interceptor. Why did you go for this colour? Well, I wanted to have a bit of a nod back to its heritage. Still, the blue. It's a little bit darker than the azure blue, and it's got the metallic fleck in there. Yeah, I mean, and it, it seems like it. a really modern colour. This, which is great. Yeah. You know, you, your car, you have it the way you want, and I think it's absolutely stunning. It's Thank beautiful. you. Beautiful. My idea with this car was to try and attract younger people to still be interested in classic yeah. cars, particularly the E-Type. Not trying to spoil the E-Type, just trying I, to enhance I, I totally it a little bit. I get it, Paul. I'm doing a Cornish convertible up, and I want to paint it like a grey, or like a modern grey, you yeah. know, like a straight grey, to give it, like you say, that cut, sort of a modern twist yeah. on a classic car. Yeah. And you've got, to be, you've got to work really carefully because you don't know till you've painted it whether it works or not sometimes, do you yeah, as well? I know, and it's got a match with the interior. Yeah. It's got to complement each other, but I've always been quite lucky and, and, you know, in that respect, I've been really lucky because cars I've done in the past where people have said, you can't do the interior that colour and you can't paint it, it's got to be silver yeah. with red. And I've gone against them all <laughs> and I've gone, wow. And, and they've works. gone, wow, you're right. You know, so I've been lucky. Wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've got to be careful, as you know, with the bonnets yeah. that you I don't think catch. It's when there's a curb in front of you, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, curb. You've got to be absolutely careful. There's not a lot of clearance, but they're really good at uh, lifting up. The car was originally automatic. Oh, yeah. So they put five speed in there. It's kind of a manual in one of these, hasn't it? Yeah. Brakes are improved. LED headlights on here, air conditioning, uh, power steering. It has been really encouraging at the show, the number of young people that have come up and said, wow, I'd yeah. never have dreamt of owning an E-Type, yeah. but now I see this, I want whoa. One. Yeah, it's one of the most thanks very much. cars Oh, the thank show. you, thanks very much, that's kind of you. And staying on the theme of E-Type Jaguars, as I stroll over to the auction section, there's actor Nigel Havers, E-Type Jaguar, up for sale in the auction. 
and I also come across this beautiful Lotus Elite in unusual gold. So John, lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you too. So tell me about your beautiful car. Well, oh, it looks to me like a, a lightweight. It, it, it tell is. me the story about I'm it. I'm trying to build a lightweight replica. Yeah. And I started 20 plus years ago, I may even be 30. Yeah. I was given a body shell by a gent from Australia or New Zealand, I can't remember, in the very early 80s, which was all that was left of the car he had an accident in, in the UK. Oh, right. And he'd sold the rest of the stuff or sent it back to his homeland. And the last big lump of metal to get rid of was the body shell. Yeah. So I went and got it and I shoved it up against the side of my garage in the early 80s and forgot about it. Right. It was steel. So of course it rusted away. Yeah. And then I got an opportunity to have an aluminium body shell made. Oh, yeah. But I know. needed the bulkhead, this bit, this bit here. Yeah. I well, needed it. And of course I had it, although it was very rusty. So the rest of the thing got thrown away, the front bit got saved, a new floor in steel yeah. and steel bulkhead on the back was made. Yeah. It's not light, I know, but it's straight so it won't split if you decide to race it. Yeah. And, and obviously the beautiful aluminium body on the outside. I love the wide huge, wheels at the back. Huge wheels on the back, wow. lightweight doors, perspex windows, more louvers in the bonnet, louvers in the bar top and yeah. on the boot lid. Wow. Yeah, which are all, all lightweight E-type bits. John, it's, yeah. it's one of a kind, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's beautiful. I put the back lights on it, and I put the seat belts in it, and I put the dashboard in for, for this show. Yeah. And I put the radiator on, and the header tank, which is all different as well. So does it all um, run? Yeah, yeah, no, the engine's no. very close to running. The exhaust yeah. I've got, but it's at home. It's a 4.2 engine, yeah. and it had to be a 4.2 engine to run the tequilamite injection system, which is not used on lightweight E-types, but it's used on E-types, period, yeah. early 60s. Yeah. And there's none around, and I thought it was a bit of fun to put it back on. What a beautiful and, car, what a really and unusual the, the car the suspension, well. it's lightweight E-type suspension. I mean, what would you pay for a, for a lightweight? Oh, God knows, God yeah. knows. Ja yeah. Since like then, Jaguar, no, since then, Jaguar have, have remade them, haven't they? Yeah. made about eight. We yeah. sold them for a million each or something stupid like that, yeah. which is good for me because Absolutely. I like the fact that Jaguar are so interested in it. Crack on with it, John. Yeah, crack you on said with it. it. They moved the battery to this side. Yeah. Also the solenoids because the starter's on this side. These are brake fluid slot. Goes into the collecting bottle there. Yeah. That's the way they did it in the early 60s. Simple as I yeah. just copied it. That's all yeah. I've done. Done the same. Yeah. It's not that far away, no, is it? No, it's not. We've got to finish putting the wiring loom in. It just needs a little yeah. final push. Yes, yeah. John. Yeah. Thank you so much okay, for showing me the car, I really appreciate it. it. You're welcome. For me, I love the green Mark 1 Escort over there, the two-door. Oh, there is a DTM replica Calibra with a Ryger kit on down there. Gary, tell me what's your favourite. Uh, it's a strange one, really. Over in the uh, restoration of the Balfine, over there, there's a, a Cadillac Sunflower. And what's your favourite? I'm normally drawn to the rusty Rex, but actually I saw this little, lovely, beautifully restored yellow imp. Wasn't it the last car to be sold in Britain for under a thousand pounds? The Hillman M. That's a factoid. You know what? Slightly different, I think. But there's an Allard over there. Yeah. Coach built silver one. Yeah, it's lovely. It with no engine. The old like X racing history. Love it. It just captures. I walked past it and then got chatting to the people there. So it's like captures a moment in British history. My one is ob ob obvious. Has anybody been up to the barn finds and seen that yellow stack? It's less car, more art installation. You can literally smell it as you walk towards it. I build classic racing cars for a living. Uh, 1950s, 1960s sports cars. Uh, I'm also raced quite a few times at places like the Goodwood Revival, Silverstone Classic, all those kind of events. But I love modifying classic cars. So when a friend of mine, um, say, started to build this but then, then had to move it on, this was a project that just absolutely screamed to me as being right down my street. So tell me, Richard, is this... Is this made to look old? No, not at all. So this... This is all original, yeah? Yeah, everything you see on the car is exactly as it was found. Wow. So this car came from Texas. Yeah. Uh, so dry state. Some damage. Yeah, and, and you know, we're going to be very careful to make sure we preserve that because yeah. that is exactly how yeah. we found it. Wow. Uh, I love the skirts as well. I love the way it comes like down yeah. low on the wheel. Yeah. So um, suspension wise, she's running hydraulics. Yeah. So full height adjustment. We can have it pretty much touching the floor yeah. or we can jack it right up. Engine wise, so we're currently building a Mazda rotary engine. Four rotors. I don't know if, you're, if you've if you got much experience or know much about rotary engines. Oh, yeah, that's you. 
Yeah, the yeah. NSU obviously as the, the first, and then later on the RX7. Well, I, I think the you know the NSU was years ahead of its time. I think BMW stole the shape of it. Yeah, you know, I, the can early BMWs. I can see that. And I think it's something you know the rotary engine is something they should have continued with, just like the electric engines. When they went with the petrol, they should have continued with the electric engines, and we wouldn't be in the predicament yeah. we're in now. Yeah. We'd be yeah. years ahead of that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a big thing for discussion, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, I'm a big fan of the rotary engines. Yeah. So the uh, so the, the full rotor we're building is actually two RX-8 engines bolted together. Yeah. Uh, which is a slightly unconventional way of doing it. Um, uh, I don't actually know anyone that's done it before, which should be good for, we're hoping, between five and 600 horsepower. Yeah. So you're, you're talking nine, 10,000 RPM. Yeah. It'll absolutely howl. Really These are well. the original front seats, are they? Yes. Um, so it, you look there, you can actually see it's Texas Department of Public Safety, yeah, which is yeah. quite cool. Uh, yeah. Oh, I wonder who owned this in Texas. Yeah, I, I, it, that'd be, it would be great to find that out. It's the original UK car, surely. I, no, I don't think so. Well, it's but a right-hand it, drive. It's right-hand drive now because we've converted it. Oh, I see. Tell me about the lights, Richard. So, what's this? Is that a horn or a light? So that's a hole. Yeah. And um, that will go through to the air intake for the engines. Yeah. The other one's just a cover. So we will probably actually have that as a working headlight, but mm -hmm. keep that one as just an air intake. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got the the twin Marshall uh, yeah. uh, spots as well. Yeah. Uh, the the mirrors they're actually a Japanese. They're actually a Japanese mirror off oh, wow. of uh, like a, an old Nissan. Toyota or a Nissan yeah, or yeah. something like that. Uh, but yeah, it's it, it certainly draws a crowd. Yeah. And yeah. with what we're planning with it, I think this is going to be a really special build. Hayden, so this, is, this is your car, yeah? Yep. Yep. Tell me a bit about it. Well, we've we've had we've owned it for forty six years. Um, originally, she's a, eight, a 62 white fixed head that was sold uh, to a gentleman in London who um, managed fish and chip shops. You're kidding me. Um, he sold it in turn to a chap called John Wilson. Now, John decided he was going to pick up young ladies down the King's Road with it, <laughs> but he got bored with doing that. He modified it, took it to Silverstone and end over ended it big style. Yeah. Went to Jaguar, got a new drop head shell from Browns Lane and rebuilt the whole car as a drop head. He then modified it further, had a really good year in 68 with it and got some lap records with it, sold it to a chap called Mike Franey. Mm. Now Mike immediately got a really good engine for it and he cleaned up in the mud sports. He in turn sold it to a chap who I knew very well called Ted Worswick. Uh, so hey then, sorry to stop you there. This is a convertible, yeah? Yeah, it is. And that's a hard top, yeah? That's Removal a hard top. We've, we've put the hard, removable hard top we've put on top to make it, it to make it easier to, to run. Yeah, and what size are them wheels at the back? They're 11 and a half inch. Avons as well? Yeah. They go off after a mile. They'll stick to the road, yeah? Yeah. Ted in turn sold it to some to a number of chance, changed hands in the what called the Liverpool Mafia. And then I bought it from, again, a very good friend of mine called um, Fred Cliff who was re a really well-known Jaguar, on, Jaguar what, man. What, what do you mean, the Liverpool Mafia? Well, there, there, were, there were about three or four different lads and they were all changing cars all the time and having a really good time. Yeah. And we nicknamed them the Liverpool Mafia. Mind if they come, they'll probably get, I'll be in trouble for that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I bought it for the princely sum of two and a half thousand pounds in 1977. Uh, you should get the money back on that. There's a lot of money back then. Just think back then you had to be really affluent to be able to run a car and compete with a car like this back in that day. Well, actually, it was it was a it was a very misunderstood category because you could buy in those days um, an E-Type for a thousand pounds or eight hundred and fifty quid. Yeah. Modify it as much as you could and go circuit racing with it. Yeah, but hey, you can buy a house for that back then. Yeah, I know I did do. <laughs> <laughs> But I live in South Yorkshire, I don't live in London. Yeah. And that's the difference. Pain, We'd, it's a one-off, isn't it? Yeah. I've never seen one like this it's, before. It's one of the only surviving mud, mud sports cars of the 60s era that's yeah. left as it was. Wow. Now we've got full race engine, um, yeah, we've, we've got triple Webers on it, we've got a Cosworth crank, 300 brake horsepower, and 300 foot-pounds of torque. A cool down. It needs, needs to take the pin out to the other side. Right. Um, this is glass fibre, again, to keep the weight down. Yeah. It's about 1,000 to 1,025 kilos, but we've had some good results from uh, the 60th anniversary of the E-Type. 
Um, it was the fastest sea type up Shelsley. Wow. Hey, it's a real credit to you. And thank you so much for showing us You're more than welcome. She's a lo lovely car. She's jump in, see, have, have a feel at it. No, if I jump in, I won't get out. Oh, you'll get out. You're, you're slimmer than I am. And you're younger than I am. Back over in the Footman James Barn Fine section. Look what won the Barn Fine car of the show. Surprise, surprise. The Cadillac Flower. <laughs> I wasn't wrong. I even found out a little bit about the car's history and what it was actually used for. Funeral cortege is for a flower car to follow the hearse. There and the go. flowers are loaded into that car, particularly in funerals for people who are quite well connected. Um, yeah. Or have hay fever. Yeah, exactly. So that's a, that's a, that's a tradition. What a, I didn't realise that. So remember earlier on in the show when I mentioned that Morris Minor that had been gifted to a 14-year-old girl? Well, I eventually meet up and speak to Emily Grace. Hello. I've heard so much about you. Yeah. And I think it's fantastic what you do because you represent the young people in this country who I think there's not enough of in some yeah. classic cars. Definitely. I think it's so important that young people love and care for classic cars. And why, why do you think that? Because there is no future for classic cars without the younger generations and it's so important that the older generations teach us and share their stories and encourage us to yeah. keep working on them. Well, cars, cars bring people together, don't yeah. they? When I was growing up, the done thing was you'd work on a car with your dad yeah. or you'd tinker on a Sunday afternoon in the driveway. And I think because of the age of computer cars, that's kind of gone out the window a little exactly. bit because they're too difficult to work on now. So it's right what you say, it's good to own a classic car and get that relationship going again. Yeah, it's not only the relationship with the cars, but the like people you're working with, definitely. I've got closer with my dad through it, yeah. and I think that's really important. I mean, it makes strangers bond together, and I think that's yeah. crucial. And you know, every car's got a story. I know it's an old cliche, but you know, there be a, a, a car that somebody's maybe got married in, yeah. or it belonged to the dad or the granddad. You know, I had a lady come up to me today and she said, my father passed away recently and he's left a 1933 SS Jaguar and it's in boxes and she needs to find a new home for it because she sold his house. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, we went over to the, the Jaguar Drivers Club and there was another friend of mine, John, who was really interested in purchasing the car and putting it back on the road. Yeah. But you know, the memories that came with it and she was well enough and she was really getting upset talking about it. Oh, it's just lovely. Cars bring us together, yeah, don't they? Yeah, they capture everything. Yeah. yeah. Is there any particular charities that you're interested in or support? I mean, I'm an ambassador for Starter Motor, which yeah. help young people get into old cars. Yeah. Um, so they provide us with opportunities um, to get into the motor business. They've offered me a, well, they've got me a work experience placement with Octane Magazine. Yeah, wow. Um, so they've helped us all. They teach us how to drive and work on cars and it's, yeah. They're a really good charity. And that it, deserves is that what you want to do, Emily? Do you want to like be a mechanic, or is it just an interest, a, a, think, a hobby? I think, yeah, it is a hobby. I think I want to be a journalist in motorsport. Yeah. But I mean, you need to be able to work on a car to talk about it. I mean, Absolutely. there's no better way to learn an yeah. engine. It's very true. It's it's good to have some kind of experience so you know what you're talking about. Yeah, you can watch as many videos as you want, but you need to get your hands dirty to learn a car. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Emily, lovely talking to yeah, you. Yeah, lovely talking. And keep up the cause. Yeah, nice to meet you. We need more people like you. And what a great way to end this restoration show weekend. Hopefully find out a new custodian for Sue's father's SS Jaguar and meeting people like Emily, a trailblazer leading the way for young people to get into classic cars. Thank you for watching this episode of Classic Obsession. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to like and subscribe. And see you all next time.